Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Wrapped in a woolen white scarf, Pam walked leisurely through the snow-covered alleys of the old city cemetery. In her hands, she clutched tightly a bouquet of six white roses. These flowers were meant for her loved ones. Two for her son, two for her mother-in-law, and the remaining pair for her beloved husband, Michael, who had recently passed away. It's been 40 days since you've been with me. In her mind, she turned to her late husband. How unfair it is, how cruel of you. Why did you leave me alone to live out my life? You promised me that we would always be together. And now I'm alone. It was like they were from different planets, and the two were so different from each other. And yet, something had kept them together for years, if not love. It was this strong feeling that united the spouses, and they were there for each other, in spite of all the conventions and the long opposition of the mother-in-law. Michael was born into an intelligent family. His father had once worked in the government, but had been dead for several years, and his widowed mother Ilona was an art critic known in small circles. Michael had just turned 20 that memorable summer. A long-necked, skinny student of pedagogical school, he was spending his hot days in the suburbs of Moscow. The fact is that Ilona decided to make repairs in the apartment, and in order not to experience the inconvenience associated with this venture, mother and son temporarily moved to the cottage. In August, the repairs were nearing completion, and one morning the parents sent Michael to Moscow. The young man's purpose was simple, to check on the repairs and arrange with the painters to wash the windows and clean up the basic debris. As a rule, this kind of things Ilona preferred to do herself, adhering to the rule you want to do well, do it yourself. She generally liked to be in control of everything. But on that day, a very famous Orientalist professor was going to visit her, and the woman could not reschedule the scheduled meeting. Michael happily complied with his mother's request. He was tired of being stuck in the middle of nowhere. He wanted to go home, the capital where life was boiling, to his friends and the hustle and bustle of the city and the television. In the end, the front door to his apartment was covered with newspapers, and there were tiny white footprints imprinted on the rubber mat by the door. All this clearly hinted that repairs were in progress. The door was ajar. Loud, melodic sounds were heard from the radio in the apartment. Male voices in a foreign language were singing in an upbeat way. Michael stepped quietly into the hallway and saw a young girl in black sweatpants rolled up to her knees. She was wearing only a beige bra on top, which emphasized the voluminous breasts. Oops, she cried out loudly, immediately covering the cleavage area with her hands. Her round, pretty face was bruised from embarrassment, which was visible even under the white powder of whitewash. The pretty blonde looked about 18, 19 years old. Sorry, I wasn't expecting strangers. It's just very hot in the apartment, she explained, and they hurriedly retreated to the kitchen. And I'm not a stranger. I'm the host, Michael answered. He tried to keep his cool important, though in fact he was embarrassed in front of the girl himself. You can do it now, shouted the painter from the kitchen a few minutes later. When Michael came in the girl was already wearing a short sundress and small flowers. It looked good on her. Sorry again about that, she said embarrassedly. It was so embarrassing. No, it was you, I'm sorry. It was my fault. I should have knocked first, in turn, said Michael. The young man held out his hand. My name is Michael. What's yours? The girl looked at her whitewashed palm, wiped it several times on her sundress, and shook Michael's hand. And I'm Pam. There was an awkward pause. Afterwards, she gave Michael a tour of the apartment, showing him the fruits of her hard work. What kind of wallpaper do you like better? Monochrome in the hallway or the ones in flowers in the bedroom? She asked. And the diamond one in the living room is very original, isn't it? Michael nodded knowingly, even though he knew nothing about renovation or interior design. Frankly, he didn't care. Then Pam took him into the bathroom. What do you think of the new toilet? And the ceramic tiles? It's so shiny. Do you like it? She asked. 
Then Pam showed off the whitewashed ceilings in the kitchen, the new smooth linoleum on the floor, and she was so genuinely happy, as if it were her own apartment. What is it that I'm quite tormented you? Pam fluttered her arms. You must be tired from the trip. Would you like some tea? I'll make it in a jiffy, or cranberry morsel. Indeed, I am thirsty as hell. I think a morsel would be very nice. The young man nodded. Pam and Michael sat down on the kitchen sofa, covered with newspapers, and drank the ice-cold cranberry morsel in silence. At that moment, a fat, older woman with a sullen, displeased face entered the kitchen. Why did you come? She muttered with a furrowed brow. I told your mother four days at least. That's the impatience of people need to send an inspection. This is a Levtina, my aunt, Pam explained hastily. It was obvious that the girl is uncomfortable for his disrespectful relative, and I did not come just for fun. I, in fact, on business, said Michael somewhat confused. Alevtina haughtily looked at the host's son with an undisguised grin. Mom asked you to wash the windows and take out the trash, said Michael. That is not part of our services, Alevtina cut off. Michael immediately reached into his pocket and handed the woman the money. Alevtina's thick black eyebrows raised in surprise. For these pennies I will not lift a finger. Insulted her. Come on, aunt. Why are you angry? Pam came into the conversation. Why are we with you? Don't we wash the windows for the good people? Good people, and pay accordingly. Alevtina threw angrily. You can do what you want, but I'm not going to slay for pennies. The older woman gave Michael an icy look with her small eyes, and then went out with a loud slam of the front door. Please don't be offended, Pam excused herself. She's not a bad aunt, she's a hard worker. It's just that her son had a bad temper. He's been in and out of jail for stupid reasons. That's why she gets mad at everybody. Nervous, worried. Finally discouraged, Michael waved his hand. I'm not offended. By the way, I have to run an errand right now. I'll be gone till tonight. He shuttled around Moscow all day, visited a friend who had just returned from Georgia and talked vividly about an unforgettable vacation. Then Michael had lunch at a cafe. And in the evening, when the summer heat had slightly subsided, he returned to his apartment. It was quiet inside. All the newspapers were gone, the windows were shiny, and the trash was neatly folded in a cardboard box. Michael walked quietly into the living room and saw Pam, who, sitting up, was dozing in an armchair. For some reason, the young man found her incredibly attractive. He longed to touch her with his hand, to feel her soft, smooth maiden body with his fingers, and, better yet, to kiss her plump lips. But instead, after a few moments of indecision, Michael coughed delicately to indicate his presence. The girl immediately opened her eyes. Sorry, I'm exhausted. I sat down for a minute to rest. I must have dozed off. But now that you're home, I'll be getting ready. Pam's been showing up. There's not much left to do in the apartment except finish the baseboards in the kitchen and a few other little things. I think we'll be done tomorrow. Michael took a bottle of red Kins Morale wine that a friend had given him. Why don't you stay and keep me company? What am I going to drink alone? Like an alcoholic. In fact, why do you have to go at night? Especially since I'll be back in the morning. There's plenty of room in the apartment. Shall we settle down somehow? He made an unexpected suggestion. Didn't he? Pam was genuinely happy. Honestly, I'm so tired I'm exhausted. My feet are so tired and I'm not close to get to the station, and then another 40 minutes by train. Well, all the more reason to stay, Michael exclaimed. He searched for a long time in the kitchen for a corkscrew, but could not find it. It wasn't without difficulty in the end. The young man pushed the cork inside and poured the wine into goblets. The fridge was practically empty and there wasn't much to snack on. So Pam and Michael got tipsy very quickly, both from the alcohol and from the air in the apartment. Pam asked permission to take a shower, and in the meantime Michael walked unsteadily to the parents' bedroom to make the bedding for the guests. 
But as it happened, he found himself with Pam on the natural mahogany double bed, the object of Ilona's eternal pride. That night the young people spent together. They were inexperienced in love affairs. However, Michael next to Pam felt like a real man and a hero lover. It was incredibly easy for him with this girl. There was no awkwardness, stiffness, and other shyness. Everything was very natural and easy, as if it was not the first time for them. They only fell asleep at dawn. They woke up to the sound of someone banging on the front door. Pam's asleep, isn't she? Come on, open up. Aunt Aleptina's angry cry was heard. The girl jumped up in horror, hastily pulled on her sundress, and rushed to open. Astute Aleptina enough one look at the disheveled-looking niece to understand what it is all about. And so it is clear, she nodded longingly. And then she chuckled. You're a lively girl, aren't you? Not a bad girl. And you pretended to be so quiet. But you're out of your depths, girl, not your bird. And you can't fly together. Mistress'll have you down in no time. Pam was frightened and trembled like an aspen leaf in the wind. Was her aunt going to tell Alona? She worried, but Michael didn't seem to care. He looked at the anxious Pam and admired her beauty. Her smooth round hips, large breasts, strong legs, soft blonde hair, and a snub nose studded with freckles. This girl was so different from his familiar classmates. There was a special kind of rare beauty in her, soft, simple, so understandable and gentle. Next to Pam was warm and comfortable. All day long the women were tinkering, scrubbing, and cleaning. Michael tried not to get under their feet and only furtively glanced at Pam all day. He didn't feel like going back to the cottage. And more than anything else, the young man wished that the stern aunt quickly went away and left him alone again with his niece. But Aleftina was in no hurry to leave and stayed until evening. Around seven o'clock, the women called Michael from the corridor. The young man came out and saw them wearing makeup and clothes. Leaving already, a piteous cry came out from the boy. Yes, Aleptina smirked. And tomorrow, your mother, let her come. The work must be accepted. Michael nodded at a loss. Pam stood across the hall, her eyes downcast with embarrassment, nervously fidgeting with her purse. He really wanted to stop her to hold her, to grab her hand, and ask her not to leave him. But he was ashamed to show his feelings in front of strangers. He was ashamed to admit it, but he was somewhat afraid of the girl's sarcastic aunt. At last, they said goodbye. Alevtina and Pan left the apartment. Upset, Michael went to the kitchen to drink tea and blame himself for his cowardice. But ten minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Michael opened the door with joyful anticipation. His expectation was not deceived. Standing before him on the threshold was Pam. She was embarrassed, shifting from foot to foot. How happy he was at this moment. Pam was back. That meant she cared about him too. And once again, it was another wonderful night. Exhausted, they lay on the sheets, snuggled up against each other. Pam told Michael about her life, which was not an easy one. Pam's parents had died early, when she was just a baby. Her mother died of childbirth fever, and her father, six months later, froze to death in a snowdrift while drunkenly walking home from the next village. And from then on, Pam lived in the village with her grandparents, in an old house with a stove and conveniences in the yard. They lived more than modestly. Grandfather and grandmother received a meager pension and could barely make ends meet. If it were not for the vegetable garden, they would certainly have starved to death. Old people would have been able to feed themselves. And here was a teenager who needed clothes and shoes. So Pam started earning her own money when she was 15. She graduated from the local vocational school as a plasterer and got a job at a construction site for a penny. It was very hard for a very young girl at a construction site. They did not pay much, moreover, constantly had to beat off the dirty harassment of men. So when her aunt Alutina called her to her partner to do private repairs, she immediately accepted. This work was also far from sugar. After all, there were times that customers were picky met all the souls shake out before paying, 
and sometimes they left without paying. Still, Pam did not complain about her life and took everything philosophically. What was the point of grumbling against fate? To each his own, she said. I guess it's karma for me. The next day, Pam went home, and Michael went to the cottage. There he gave his mother a detailed report on the progress of the repairs, and then went to his room, where he thought long and hard about Pam. He himself could not understand what had attracted him to this seemingly simple and uneducated girl, but there was something about her that tugged and called to his soul and body. I wonder if she also thinks of me. He worried. The young man, he remembered Pam's soft, pleasant, rounded body, her gentle hands and her eyes so devoted and trusting. And more than anything, he wanted to see her as soon as possible. In the morning, Ilona went to the capital, and in the evening she returned and began to resent the poor quality of the repairs. She scolded the slacker and Aleptina and her crooked journeyman. To her everything was not so and not so. The same case of the cranky customer Pam was talking about. Michael thought to himself. All this was very unpleasant for him to listen to. After all, it was about a girl he was not indifferent to. The next morning he left for Moscow. He lied to his mother that he had urgent business concerning his studies. He said he had to go to the dean's office. In fact, he spent the whole day by the phone waiting for Pam to call and berating himself for not asking for her address or number. At lunchtime, Michael's friends came over and invited him to go to the movies, but he declined. Although the movie promised to be very interesting, and he really wanted to see it. But how could he leave the apartment in case Pam called at the same time? But Pam did not make herself known. But in the evening, a former classmate of Kate's called, just arrived from the Black Sea. The girl talked at length and colorfully about an unforgettable vacation in the South, especially about how she did not give a pass to the local men. And then Kate asked Michael if we could meet. He politely declined, citing business. Then Kate boldly hinted that her parents had gone to the cottage and left her home alone. I'm going to spend the night alone in the bedroom, Kate informed him languidly. Not long ago, Michael would have run to her after saying that. But not now. Kate was pretty good-looking, tall, slender. And after her summer vacation, she must have been tanned. And even prettier. Now, however, Michael was not interested in anyone but Pam. Kate was perplexed. She had almost openly suggested that Michael spend the night together, but he refused. Then an offended Kate called him the last words and hung up on him, but he was not offended by the former classmate. Let her think what she wanted of him. He had a whole other question on his mind. What if we never see Pam again? He was frightened, he thought, and he was going crazy with the suspense. The girl didn't call until two days later. Michael was over the moon. Even though he scolded Pam for her long silence, the young people met in the center of the city. They strolled through Alexander's garden, after which Michael walked her to the train station. Soon the summer ended and classes began at the Pedagogical Institute. Lectures, seminars, tests consumed a lot of time and energy. Nevertheless, every day after classes, Michael rushed to another meeting with Pam. Sometimes they would go to a cafe or holding hands, walk in the park, but more often the lovebirds would get on the train and go to an empty dacha, where no one could stop them from loving each other with awe and delight. It went on like that until the beginning of winter when the frost hit. The small stove could not cope with such cold weather. It was impossible to warm the dacha, and going there became quite impossible. This upset the lovers, but they were not discouraged. And after the New Year's holidays, a confused Pam unexpectedly told Michael that she was pregnant. The news took him by surprise. Are you sure about this? He asked. Yes, she nodded. The doctor at the antenatal clinic today confirmed my fears. She is seven to eight weeks, and I have no idea what to do. I'm really scared, Michael. I was wondering if you could find me a good doctor to get me an abortion before it's too late. Michael was confused too, and blamed himself for the indiscretion that had caused the accident. He had no female doctor he knew, and the only person he could turn to on such a sensitive issue was his mother. She had plenty of connections in all kinds of circles, 
from carpenters to antique dealers, and for sure there was a good gynecologist among them. But how could he approach his parent with such a delicate problem? It's okay, Pam reassured him the next day. I found a doctor through a friend who will take care of the matter at the end of the week. The young man was relieved at first that everything would work out so well for them. But after a feeling of relief was replaced by anguish of conscience, he thought of what he had done as a coward. He had made a mess of things. And into the bushes. What kind of man am I if I cannot take responsibility for my own actions? Critically, he thought, and resolved to rectify the situation radically. In the morning, Michael bought a modest bouquet of white roses and went to meet Pam. Will you marry me? He asked. Of course I will. Joyfully exclaimed the girl, and with tears of happiness, threw herself on the neck of her beloved. She did not want to worry him, and was afraid to admit how afraid she was of going to an abortion. Now Pam's grief was off her shoulders, and she looked at Michael as if he were the knight who had saved her life. He was unspeakably proud of himself, puffing out his cheeks with self-importance. He seemed to have done everything right, but there was still the most important thing, to inform him of his mother's imminent marriage and how to do it delicately and correctly. He had no idea, but to delay a serious conversation was impossible, nor was it possible to backtrack. So, plucking up the courage one evening, Michael sat his mother down on the sofa and asked her not to worry. After these words, which should have reassured Alona, the woman, on the contrary, went to her heels. Did you get kicked out of the institute? She clutched her heart. No, no. With studies are fine, her son assured her. What had happened then? Michael took a deep breath and blurted it out. I'm getting married soon, because the girl I love is pregnant. Is this a bad joke? Nervously swallowing asked Alona. She refused to believe that everything her son had said was true. No, mom, it's not a joke, Michael answered. It's more than serious. And by next fall, I will be a father, and you will be a grandmother. Ilona almost fainted from such a statement. She gestured for me to dig her some valacordon, and a little come to her senses, asked who the chosen one of her son. Do I even know her? I hope your fiancé comes from a decent family. Is it your classmate Kate? The woman asked. No, it has nothing to do with Kate. My fiancé's name is Pam, and you've met her. She is a partner of Aleptina, who recently did repairs in our house. Michael answered with a gasp. What did you say? Aleptina's partner. You got a painter pregnant. Surprisingly dropped her eyebrows, mother. Yes, he confirmed. You must be out of your mind. Ilona exclaimed. Do you even hear what you say? No, you're out of your mind to bring a handyman into our house. What were you thinking, having an affair with her? What am I going to tell people to all our friends, acquaintances, co-workers? How am I going to introduce this Pam? How lucky that your father didn't live to see this day. And for what my sins have heaven sent this punishment? Mother, please, don't be so dramatic. Nothing fatal happened. Pam is a beautiful girl and not badly brought up. Even though she is a country girl, Michael answered, I am sure you will like her too when you get to know her. You are such an idiot. Irritated, Alona broke off into a cry. She tricked you. She tricked you like a foolish boy. Saw our richly furnished apartment and decided to go from pawns to queens through the bed. And you fell for it, you sucker. No, you're wrong. Pam's not like that at all. Michael protested, raising his voice to his mother for the first time. When we get married, I will bring her to our house. You'll see for yourself. After an appraisal of the impending catastrophe, Ilona declared categorically. Ilona declared categorically, it will never happen. We'll see about that. Threw Michael and went to his room, slamming the door loudly. The woman was left alone to sit on the sofa in utter bewilderment. It seemed to her that life was going down the drain. Everything was unthinkable. Her only beloved son, a well-mannered, obedient boy, who had never spoken a word against her, declared war on her. She, in turn, boycotted him and stopped talking to him. But Michael didn't care about his mother's shenanigans. 
He was concerned only with his beloved and their unborn child. Every day, he met with Pam. They went for walks together in the fresh air in the park. After all, such walks are good for the health of the mother and fetus. Then the lovers would go to the pie shop, where on a scholarship Michael would buy Pam a ruddy meatloaf and then watch with tenderness as the pregnant woman ate them up to her cheeks. It must be a boy, Pam remarked one day. The old women in the village say that if you have a craving for sweets, it will be a girl. I have a craving for meat, and that's a sure sign of an heir. A boy it is. Michael nodded. In the main, he didn't care who it was, as long as he got things right with his mother. He wasn't by nature a conflicted man and being in a quarrel with anyone. He was always wildly uncomfortable. A month went by and Alona still wouldn't talk to him. Then Michael, in desperation, took a desperate step and put the question to his mother. Either she accepts the whole situation as it is, or he leaves home. Your Pam will never set foot in my apartment. She will not set foot on this threshold over my dead body, said the angry woman. She cut me off. That trash has turned you around, and now she wants the property that your dead father and I worked for by blood and sweat. But I won't let her do that. Meanwhile, Michael and Pam filed for a marriage license. They still met every day. More than once, Michael accompanied his fiancée to the women's clinic. It seemed to the young man that his belly was growing by leaps and bounds. Ilona held the defense until one of her wise friends, the very professor of Oriental Studies, pointed out to her the future not-so-bright prospects. You'll lose your son, Ilona, if you keep this up, she said. In your situation, it's best to accept it, and then we'll see. Life will put everything in its place. After all, there's still the matter of divorce. One day your Michael will see the light and find an equal. Ilona, though a willful person, was far from stupid. She eventually heeded her friend's advice and began to build bridges. But still she flatly refused to live with Pam, preferring to rent them an apartment. The wedding day was approaching. Art historian and could not leave her only son without a celebration. After all, the first time my little blood is getting married. And God willing, not the last, she thought. Ilona booked a restaurant. She bought her son an expensive suit. And Pam bought a wedding gown, which the bride absolutely did not like. She, like all girls, since childhood dreamed of a white wedding dress. But the future mother-in-law gifted her with a strict beige suit. Not accustomed to wearing such things, Pam felt out of place, as if she were not a bride but some kind of party worker. Nevertheless, Pam did wear a suit to the wedding to please her mother-in-law. At the wedding, the girl was shy from the fact that there were all unfamiliar and important people, all professors and bright science. All the guests from the groom's side looked at the bride a little haughtily, and Ilona with frank sympathy. And on Pam's side, there was only one girlfriend from her vocational school days. Aunt Alevtina didn't come to the wedding for some reason. Maybe she was embarrassed. Maybe she was just jealous of her niece's happiness. Although Ilona helped the newlyweds financially, they still lacked money catastrophically. But Michael did not dare to ask his mother for more. It was embarrassing enough. So the newlyweds had to find a way to get out of it, to make repairs at a late stage. Pam could not. It was hard with a big belly. Her knees hurt a lot. And the doctor had forbidden physical activity. But the mother-to-be wasn't used to sitting idly by. And now she found a job at home. She knitted baby clothes and then sold them to market vendors. It brought though a small but still income. Michael too tried to earn something and did odd jobs in his spare time. They somehow managed to make ends meet. They even managed to save for a stroller for the unborn child. On schedule, Pam gave birth to a boy, pretty and blonde, just like his father. It was only after her grandson Oliver came along that Ilona's heart softened. But every time she came to visit her son's family, she unceremoniously peered into the kitchen pan and ran her hand over the surface of the furniture. To her great regret, there was always nothing to complain about. 
Pam turned out to be an excellent hostess. There was always a hearty meal on the stove, and the house was clean. Her husband was fed, washed and ironed, and her child was healthy and well cared for. What more could she ask for? But Ilama still wrinkled her nose and complained to her friends about her daughter-in-law every chance she got. That Pam is a redneck. She sighed. She's out of high school. Can't read a book. What can you talk to her about? That her son's family was in perfect harmony and understanding. The woman preferred to remain silent. But about her grandson Oliver she could talk for hours. Everything about this boy delighted her. What a blessing that he went to our breed. She rejoiced. Life went on as usual. Michael graduated from the institute, after which he went to graduate school. Oliver grew up and went to kindergarten. Pam went to work. She earned decent money, which provided for the family's livelihood. It was later Michael will be a PhD, will write scientific papers and books, receiving for them a solid royalty. In the meantime, Pam supported them all. However, Alumna also preferred not to notice it. Over time, Michael became a highly respected and well-known man in scientific circles. He had his own department at the Institute. He was often invited on radio and television. He was written about in scientific newspapers and magazines. He often traveled to the regions and abroad to all sorts of symposia, seminars, and conferences. Sometimes Pam would go with him. Over the years, she had trained as a cashier and worked in a grocery store. It would seem that over the years, the alumna should have come to terms with the choice of her son. But not there it was. The woman continued to judge her daughter-in-law. Just imagine, besides her peasant background and total lack of intelligence, Pam hadn't made any career, standing at the counter in an apron selling sausage and cheese. Say, well, does my only my favorite, my cleverest son deserve such a wife? She marveled in private conversations with friends. That Pam ran to her house three times a week after work to clean up and bring those notorious cheeses and sausages. She remained silent. A commoner, Aloma said, and sighed heavily. An unequal marriage is an unequal marriage. And to admit that her son Michael had been, for so many years, unreservedly happy with a commoner, she categorically refused. Michael and Pam really did live soul to soul. It seemed to them that everything in their family was perfect. And so the news that their only son was a drug addict came out of the blue. The terrible truth was revealed by chance when a vigilant resident of the apartment building next door was taking out a trash can and saw suspicious young men on the landing who were in an inadequate state. Next to them lay used syringes. The disturbed woman immediately called the police. The law enforcement officers arrived and took the drug addicts to the police station, where they later called Oliver's parents. He was almost 19 years old at the time. He was in his second year of law school and planned to become a lawyer. The professors went along with the professor's son for a long time and turned a blind eye to his absences. But finally their patience snapped and Oliver was kicked out of the school for frequent absences and failing grades. How did this happen? How could my boy get hooked on drugs? How could Michael and I have missed this moment? Pam was tearing her hair out in despair. She was terrified. And old Ilona, who had become even more grumpy and intolerable over the years, was also adding fuel to the fire. I knew this would happen. It's no surprise. It's all Pam's legacy. Daddy's a drunk. Brother's in jail. Nice kin. I'll give you that. No orange is born of an aspen tree. Her alcoholic father's bad genes took their toll. My mother-in-law liked to kick her daughter-in-law. Mom, come on. Pam and I are both to blame. We were negligent. Narrator. Each time, Michael defended his wife. Pam spoiled him. Expensive things. Technology. Whatever he wanted, she'd take care of him at a moment's notice. Too much was allowed to the boy. And that was the result. Grandma wouldn't let up. Mother, I beg you, don't blame anyone. We should be concentrating on saving Oliver, not looking for someone to blame. Michael had a good point, and I'm going to blame her because she's a criminal. She has failed to raise an only child because she is careless and irresponsible. 
Her allegedly unplanned pregnancy is the most eloquent testimony to this. This could never happen to me, the elderly woman declared. The spouses did not argue with her. They were too busy with other things, trying to save their son. They treated him in different places. They went to every narcological dispensary and clinic, to psychiatric hospitals and private clinics. They asked for both free and paid help. And then there were all kinds of folk conspiracies, psychics with hypnosis and clairvoyant grannies. Sometimes all these manipulations yielded positive results. I don't want to live like this anymore, Oliver admitted to his parents. Just thinking about the dose is unbearable. It's like I'm enslaved by those damn drugs. I promise you that I'll get better and lead a healthier life. I'm going to get back to school and get my degree. And Michael and Pam believed their child's vows, or rather, very much wanted to believe in them. They were always there for him, finding new things for him to do, suggested different hobbies. But he quickly lost interest. A month or two went by. Oliver would break down, and it would start all over again. And again, the doctors at the clinic gave him drips. The doctors didn't give any prognosis. They just took him out of his difficult condition. That's all. In front of his parents' eyes during withdrawal, their son turned from a human being into a real monster. He demanded money. And if he didn't get what he wanted, he would curse and even raise his hand against his mother or father. To buy a dose, he began stealing money from the house and then valuables. Poor Pam was fighting like a fish against ice, looking for new methods of the best specialists and drugs and Michael could not believe that he had such a respectable man's son. I work in education, sowing in the minds of young people reasonable, good, eternal. But I missed my own son. He sighed heavily. Now Michael was ashamed to lift his head and look people in the eye and share this pain with his spouse. There was no one to share it with either. The exhausting struggle to live a healthy lifestyle had lasted nearly three years, and all the while, Pam and Michael were living on a powder keg. The couple had prayed and hoped to save their son, and they weren't giving up on trying to free him from the clutches of addiction. But alas, they were not able to. The drugs won. And one day the thing the couple feared so much happened. Their Oliver took a lethal dose and died of an overdose. Pam didn't remember her son's funeral very well. At that time, Michael was in charge of all the arrangements, they say that misfortune doesn't come alone. And after Oliver's death, there was another calamity for the couple. Ilona had a stroke after the tragic death of her grandson. The old woman was paralyzed. She could no longer speak, move or take care of herself. The care of her gravely ill mother-in-law fell on Pam's shoulders. She had to quit her job and devote herself entirely to the care of Ilona. Pam had to meekly wash, bathe, feed, and feed the woman who had disliked her all her life and rebuked her at every opportunity. Are you tired? Isn't it easy for you and your mother? Michael asked her sympathetically on his way home from work. Beloma had gained a lot of weight in recent years and it was physically difficult to carry her. No, it's okay. Pam smiled wryly, barely able to stand on her feet from exhaustion. She had been used to enduring the vicissitudes of life since childhood, and it was not in her habit to complain. A year later, Aloma died in the arms of her unwanted daughter-in-law. It was an irony of fate. Michael found solace in his work and was absorbed in his academic pursuits. He was constantly traveling on business trips and was now home infrequently. The husband was somewhat distant from Pam, but she did not blame him for that. She understood that everyone experiences the loss of loved ones in their own way. Michael preferred to keep silent about everything that concerned Oliver. She, on the other hand, wanted to talk about him all the time. To remember how he'd fallen out of a tree in the country house when he was six, how he brought home a flea-bitten kitten in second grade, how he learned to ride a bicycle, how I fell in love for the first time with the girl next door. Very beautiful, but terribly naughty. All of this was left in some other life, happy, fulfilling, voluminous, for what? And most importantly, who does she live for now? Who will she take care of? Her son is gone, 
there will be no grandchildren. In what then to look for the meaning of existence? At one time, Pam was even seriously considering adoption. What if I suggested that Michael get custody of some abandoned child with a difficult fate? She pondered. For a long time, the woman wanted to discuss this serious step with her husband, but she was still hesitant. And soon she herself gave up her idea. After all, a child is not a toy in a store. You can't put it back on the shelf if you don't like it. Besides, it was a big lottery. What if Ilumna was right? and Oliver really had been killed by his grandfather's bad genes on his mother's side, Pam supposed. Where's the guarantee that an adopted child from an orphanage will have a good heredity? To put it bluntly, the chances are slim. To distract and occupy herself, Pam went back behind the counter at the grocery store. Five years had passed. Life was leisurely and joyless. One day followed the next. So similar to the previous grief always comes suddenly. That winter morning, she was getting ready for work. When the phone rang, was it Pam? An unfamiliar male voice on the other end of the line asked. Yes, I'm listening, she answered. I'm very sorry, but your husband was killed in a car accident last night. Our condolences, said the same monotone male voice. Your husband's body is in Moscow morgue number five. I will send you the address and a text message. Pam slowly sank into a chair. Wait, I do not understand. Are you saying that Michael is dead? Pam could not believe her ears. Alas, I am. The answer on the other end of the line. But there must be some mistake. Without a shadow of a doubt, Pam answered. The fact that my husband is at a symposium in Hungary. And there is no way he can be in Moscow. And besides, his car is now parked under our windows. So you must have made a mistake. I understand that you are in shock. So I'll say it again. Your husband, Michael, was in a car accident. It was the fault of a driver who fell asleep, and his truck went straight into the oncoming lane of the car with your husband. As a result, all passengers of the lorry were killed before the ambulance arrived, the interlocutor specified. All passengers, Pam asked again. Are you saying that there were other people in the car? Yes, your husband was with someone. The stranger answered, but that is not what we are talking about now. You need to go to the morgue to identify the body, and you must do it as soon as possible. Pam hung up. Thoughts in her head were confused. What kind of nonsense was that? Well, how could Michael be in Moscow when he just yesterday called me from Hungary? I did not understand the woman. Why would he lie to me and play this whole comedy? Pam tried several times to call her husband on the cell phone, but it was off. Then she decided to call the hotel directly, but could not remember which one her husband was staying at this time, and it was stupid to call them all in a row. It was a mistake. Ridiculous, just the ravings of a madman. It just can't be. I would now be able to see for myself that the body of the man who died in the accident belonged to a complete stranger. Pam talked herself on her way to the morgue, but unfortunately, she did identify the dead man as her husband. How was that possible? Pam was indignant when the shock of realizing all that had happened had passed. Had Michael deceived me and really wasn't going anywhere? But what was this lie for? Cherchez la femme, as the French say. The second body, which belonged to a woman Pam had also seen, and she immediately recognized the deceased. It was Olivia, her husband's assistant. She had once been his student and had shown great promise. The girl was very talented, Michael said of her, but she comes from a very poor family. Her father is gone. Her mother is sick all the time. Olivia has to study, and all she thinks about is how to earn an extra penny to buy medicine for her mother. The fate of this little girl reminded Pam of her own, so she did not mind that Michael periodically helped her, and financially as well. Pam saw nothing wrong with her husband wanting to support Olivia in some way. He had lost his only son, and he decided to take care of a young, gifted girl. What was wrong with that? Michael guided her, prompted her, mentored her. Later, when Olivia graduated, he hired her to work for him. 
so there was nothing surprising about the fact that Michael and his protege were together in the car. Pam didn't see it. What confused her was something else. Why had my husband lied to me about the symposium? And where he and Alip believe in his infidelity, and made the most extraordinary theories, but could not shed any light on this mysterious story of 40 days, which gave her no peace. Pam, immersed in her thoughts, wandered through the cemetery. She could see the familiar fence, and then the woman saw, next to the snow-covered graves of her relatives, two lumly figures. One was female and rather frail, and the other small, clearly belonging to a child. Who could it have been? Pam wondered, and began to go over all her acquaintances in her mind. As she stepped closer she was able to make out a woman in a long green coat and a downy white scarf from behind, and a boy about five or six years old in a blue jacket and a bright hat with a big pom-pom. He was talking loudly about something, gesticulating vigorously and with a bit of a lisp. Good afternoon, Pam said. The woman in the green coat flinched and turned around. She was twenty years older than Pam. She looked startled, as if she'd seen a ghost not a person. William, we have to go, said the stranger to the boy, gripping him tightly by the handle in a knitted mitten. She acted very fidgety and tried not to meet Pam's eyes. The baby, on the other hand, when he turned around, immediately smiled openly at Pam, exposing a mouth with missing front teeth. The woman's heart sank in that moment. The child looked just like her husband and also like Oliver as a child. The resemblance was uncanny. Our breed. A satisfied alumna would nod. For some reason Pam thought. Hurry up, William, the older woman grudgingly muttered, turning to the boy. But I still want to spend some time with my daddy. Stomped his foot the little boy, trying to pull his hand out. I said come on. The woman repeated in an unapologetic tone and dragged the boy toward the exit. Pam stared after them. What had that little boy just said, to be with his daddy, it seemed? Or did I mishear? She didn't understand. Her head felt dizzy, and to keep from falling, she sat down on the bench she and Michael had set up last year. Who was this boy, and who did he call daddy? My spouse, or maybe my son? Did Oliver have time to leave an heir? Pam's questions whirled like a merry-go-round. But why didn't I know anything about it until now? All her assumptions seemed fantastic. With a little breathing room, Pam realized, I can't believe I've been so absent-minded. Stupid, she scolded herself. She must catch up with them and ask them what they wanted. Pam dashed for the exit, but didn't have time. The woman in the green coat and the boy, right in front of her, were on the bus. All night long, Pam couldn't sleep. She wondered who she had seen in the cemetery today. The boy's age might well have been Oliver's son, but she didn't remember her son being surrounded by girls lately. And if there had been, they had been addicts like himself. Could one of the addicts have given birth to Oliver? If so, where to find her now? Could this boy be it? Michael's illegitimate son? That wasn't an option Pam discounted either. In the morning, she mustered her courage and called an old friend of her husband, the same one who had long ago given him a bottle of Georgian wine, which had begun her affair with Michael. During his lifetime, Michael had been quite close to him, and he might have been aware of his secrets. Pan was determined, by all means, to get to the bottom of it, however bitter it might be. But the comrade remained silent like a partisan. Maybe he didn't want to give up his dead friend. Maybe he really was not aware of his secrets. Three days later, Pam's doorbell rang. She wasn't expecting anyone and wondered who it could be. Looking through the peephole, Pam almost screamed in surprise. On the other side of the door stood an elderly woman in a green coat. Hello, you don't know me, but we've met recently, said the visitor when the hostess made the door. Yes, at the cemetery. I remember you. You were with a little boy, Pam confirmed. That's right. My name is Alice. The woman introduced herself, and I have something serious to talk to you about. The woman invited Alice in. She took off her coat and revealed to the hostess the excessive thinness of the elderly woman. To what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? 
Pam asked. I think we'd better sit down, Alice said. This is not an easy conversation for either of us. Well, then let's go into the kitchen, Pam answered. When the women were seated opposite one another at the table, the uninvited guest began her tale. You see, I'm Olivia's mother, she said, the one who worked with Michael. I want you to know that I am very grateful to your late husband. He was a wonderful man. I will thank him for everything he did for my daughter for the rest of my life. He was a golden man. May he rest in peace. And what a clever man. What a bright head. My sincerest condolences. His passing is an irreplaceable loss for all of us, including science. Thank you. Pam nodded. And you, in turn, accept mine. You lost your daughter, didn't you? Yes. Alice nodded. She was my only child. I couldn't give birth for a long time, you know. I'd given up on the joys of motherhood, and my marriage had fallen apart because I was childless. My spouse called me a wastrel and left me for someone else. I never got married again. And now, at the age of almost 40, when I had given up hope, God sent me a daughter. She was born as a result of a fleeting holiday romance. Amazing, isn't it? Eight years with a legitimate husband, I never got pregnant. All it took was one night of passion. And here's the result. Don't make me out to be promiscuous. It's not that at all. It's just that that man was so charming, so persistent. He made me believe in love. I fell under his disarming charm, under the sound of the surf. It's so easy to lose your head, especially when you're no longer young. And this may be your last chance to find female happiness. However, as you've probably already guessed, the continuation of the novel did not work out. My date ran away without saying goodbye. I then found out that he was married. But I am not mad at him, for he gave me not just happy moments. He gave me the meaning of my life, my unintentional joy. I named my daughter Olivia, because she really was the light in the window for me. I am an orphan myself, and have no family. That's why I brought up my daughter on my own without anyone's help. And to be honest, it wasn't easy. Admittedly, we lived hard, almost on the brink of poverty. It was especially hard when I got sick. We were barely making ends meet. After all, the lion's share of money was spent on medicines. But that all changed when Michael came into Olivia's life. From then on, things got better. I thought my daughter would pursue a career in science, but she surprised me with the news that she was pregnant. I certainly dreamed of becoming a grandmother someday, but I didn't think it would all happen so quickly. She was only 19 years old at the time. Olivia hid the name of the baby's father at first. I guessed, but I didn't say anything. It wasn't until after the birth that my daughter told me that William's father was Michael but it only took one look at the boy to know whose son he was. There's no need for DNA testing. You knew right away, didn't you? Pam was silent. Listening to this stranger's confession hurt her. After all, Olivia was a frequent visitor in their home. Pam treated her like a daughter. And it turned out that her husband had no fatherly feelings for her. Pam wanted to cover her ears, but she had to hear the whole thing and see what it was all about. Otherwise, she would have been left to wonder for the rest of her life. Believe me, I'm very embarrassed to tell you all this, Alice continued. It was as if she could read Pam's mind. Like I said, my ex-husband cheated on me too. I know what betrayal is, how painful it is. Then why did you come here and start all this unpleasant conversation? Pam asked dryly. I would never do that. I assure you my mission is not an enviable one. It is only for the sake of William's future that I dared to come. At the cemetery, when we met, I was at a loss. I wasn't quite sure what to do. And now I'm sitting across from you, saying all this. And I still don't know if I'm doing the right thing. But you should know that I was forced to take this step by some weighty circumstances, Alice admitted. What were they? The hostess inquired. The fact is that I have been seriously ill for a long time said the guest with a heavy sigh. But the disease is progressing, and it is no longer possible to fight it. My body is exhausted. It simply no longer has the strength to resist the disease. 
I only have a few months left to live, a couple of months at most, and now I'm worried about what will happen to my grandson after I die. The situation is not easy. His mother is dead, his father is in the grave, and he has no other relatives besides me. He will be left alone in the world and will go straight to the orphanage. I saw firsthand how unpleasant it is there. I wouldn't wish my enemy to go through all that humiliation, the cruelty I had experienced. That's not the fate I want for William. What's that got to do with me? Pam was surprised, not sure what the uninvited guest was getting at. I thought you could have him for yourself, if you wanted him. Alice said quietly. Me. The landlady couldn't believe her ears. Do you even hear yourself? You are a very good woman. I know that from what Michael told me. He always said his wife was a wonderful soul. Then why did he cheat on me so wonderfully? Pam grinned bitterly. I don't think Michael loved my daughter. Not as much as he loved you anyway. He was just hiding in a relationship with her, like an ostrich that buries its head in the sand when it's scared. Olivia became his safe haven, his refuge, where he could take refuge for a while and regain his strength. Beside her, he didn't think about problems in his family. It was as if he was immersed in another reality for a while, escaping his problems and hardships. Maybe with my daughter, he was just drowning out the pain for his son, Alice suggested. Why wasn't I drowning out my pain in someone else's arms? Pam exclaimed. Tears glistened in her eyes. This fact only emphasizes once again what an honest and decent man you are, Alice remarked. That is why I want you to take care of my grandson. Do you really want me to adopt William? Pam clarified. You must be joking. Unfortunately, I'm not in the mood for jokes right now, Alice answered. Your financial situation is quite stable, and I'm sure the baby won't be a burden on you. Perhaps on the contrary, it will help you. After all, as far as I know, you're all alone in the world now too. Pam stared at her guest, trying to digest what she had just said. I'm not rushing you or asking you to give an answer right now. I know it's not an easy case and it's a delicate one. You've only just buried your husband. And here I am with my request. You need to think it over, weigh it up, calculate it, and then make the right decision. But I beg you, show mercy to the poor orphan. You alone can save him. I'm leaving now, but I'll call you tomorrow night. With these words, Alice hurriedly left the professor's apartment, leaving Pam in utter bewilderment. It was time to admit that her husband Michael had led a double life. How could you do this to me? She cried, looking at the portrait of her husband in a black mourning ribbon. There was, of course, no answer. But that night she dreamt of her late husband. He was on his knees, repenting and begging forgiveness. Pam was awakened when dawn barely broke. It was going to be a hard day. She would have to make a momentous decision, one that would drastically change not only her life, but that of the little man who had her husband's blood in his veins. William, Michael's son, it was obvious to the naked eye. But this innocent little boy was a stranger to Pam. He had nothing to do with her. What would she think of every time she looked at that blonde, skinny boy? Would he be a constant reminder of her husband's infidelity? And could I raise a decent man? Pam pondered. After all, she had lost her own son. On the other hand, Alice was right. She really was no less lonely than Orphan William. What kind of life lay ahead of her? Cold long nights, empty days, holidays all alone. No one to drink tea with. No one to chat with in the evening over a cup of tea. Pam wandered through the maze of her thoughts and like Theseus from a Greek myth, could not find her way out. And how do I explain the appearance of this boy to acquaintances, colleagues, neighbors? She wondered. I'll have to tell the truth. So do not want to shake their dirty laundry in front of people. There will immediately begin gossip, crawl dirty gossip. All and will talk about how all respected scientist Michael treacherously cheated legitimate wife with his young student. Detractors would be rubbing their hands together. For these jealous people, if you give them a reason, they would stir up the late professor's name with mud. There were a great many nuances. 
Han was not young herself, and here was a child, a preschooler, to boot. He would require a lot of attention and energy. He would have to be assigned to kindergarten, then led to school and led to the clubs, and sections, to check his homework, to go to parent-teacher conferences. Is she ready for all this fuss? She has had her fair share of trials. Doesn't she deserve a peaceful old age? But a few years ago, she herself thought about adoption. And now a boy, one might say, is on her doorstep. There was no need to look for anyone, to choose, like a gift in a store, to think about some kind of genetics. She knew perfectly well who William's father was and who his mother was. She even met her grandmother in person. Pam had spent the day in agonizing reflection. No, this was a stupid idea. She should have said no to Alice in the first place. Michael had made a mess of it. So why do I have to clean it up? It's not a joke after all. A small child is a huge responsibility. Kids get sick all the time. They get naughty. They get naughty. They get naughty. And to go all the way again, I'm not ready, Pam concluded. But the thought that somewhere in the world will run a continuation of her still fervently loved spouse did not give the woman peace. How will I live with the idea that because of me Oliver's brother is brought up in an orphanage, Pam asked herself. What would my son think of me? That evening when Alice called, Pam told her that she had agreed to adopt the boy. You can't have the son of such a distinguished scientist living in an orphanage. Resolutely, she said. Weeks of running through all kinds of bureaucracy and offices followed. Pam was in a hurry. She had all the paperwork to do. While Alice was still alive, Olivia's mother was doing the best she could. Though it wasn't easy for her, she was getting worse and worse every day. She was literally melting before her eyes. Weakened and two months after their first meeting, the woman passed away. On that day, Pam brought William to her home. Until then, they had seen many times. And the boy had managed to get used to her. But this was the first time William had been in his father's apartment. How did my father come to be here? The first thing he asked when he saw the portrait of Michael on the wall. Your dad used to live here and work a lot. Do you see the big library he has here? There are a lot of books, and some of them your father wrote himself. Pam said with pride, Can you read them to me? Are there any stories about dragons? Navely he asked. No. Pam smiled fondly. There aren't any tales about dragons, but trust me, there's just as much interesting stuff. I'll teach you to read, and one day you'll see for yourself. And when you grow up, you'll go to college, become a big scientist, and continue dad's work. Are you going to be my mom now? Yes? William asked, looking inquiringly into Pam's eyes. I guess I am. He nodded affirmatively. She nodded affirmatively. But you're old. I want my mother, Olivia. She's beautiful and young. Pam whimpered, and she knew it wasn't going to be pretty, and that she was in for a world of hurt and hardship. So it was just the two of them. In the first year, Pam had to remember a lot of things and how to cook porridge, and how to skate, and how to darn children's tights. Pam tried to surround the boy with love and care, which, as it turned out, had more than accumulated in her heart, in her suddenly awakened motherly feelings that she had long forgotten. Life changed dramatically. The empty professor's apartment was filled with the happiness of children's laughter, the smell of baking, and a lot of toys scattered on the floor. Pam and William spent all their free time together, visiting amusement parks, the circus, and the theater. After all, genes are a tremendous thing. Every time Pam thought with tenderness looking at William, the boy grew up smart, extremely inquisitive, and gifted. He attended karate and drawing classes, went to music school and swimming. And no matter what he tried, he was always the best of the best. And what merit had brought this white-haired inheritance upon my head? Pam wondered, looking at her adopted son. She called him her unwanted joy. It might seem strange to some, but in time her resentment toward her husband evaporated. On the contrary, she was even now very grateful for his newfound happiness and meaning in her life. 
Pam could no longer imagine how she could live without that inquisitive boy. On William's seventh birthday, Pam gave him a Pomeranian Spitz. She knew how long the boy had dreamed of this dog, and how happy he was now to see the wagging tail gift in front of him. Thank you, Monty, shouted William, cradling his four-legged friend and gasping with delight. And Pam couldn't hold back tears of joy. After all, it was the first time he called her mother. And then she had a strong confidence that she would be able to overcome all difficulties, and everything would be all right with her and William.